Good evening. Uh, tonight I'm just going to do some excerpts from the governor's proposed budget. And the very last slide is how it all comes together and affects PUSD. So first off, uh, the state of California is still in decline. Education has been cut by 16%. Starting in 2008-9, we contribute about $7 billion to the state um, deficit to help resolve it over the last five years, over $35 billion cut from education. There's been no other segment in the budget in the state of California that's uh, come anywhere close to this uh, reduction. In fact, uh, uh, most other segments in the budget have grown over this period of time. We know that the state is still facing its fiscal challenges. Uh, one of the issues in the state is that uh, we are very dependent upon personal income tax. Uh, this slide shows a 10-year uh, past and projection on our uh, loss of jobs, about 1.3 million jobs lost between 2007 and 2010. We've recovered about a third of a million of those, so we're still a million below the peak of 07, not projected to reach the 2007 employment figures until about 2016. This is what's driving uh, the problems in California. So, thank you, Mr. Phelps. Um, Yes, it would certainly be uh, if there was uh, capital gains. That certainly helps for one year. So uh, the next chart is our uh, what we like to refer to as our alligator chart. In 2007-8, the state was funding uh, schools at about $5,821 per student. Today, or for next year, they should be funding us $6,742 based on statutory cost of living adjustments over that period of time, and many other programs have received those increases. Education is not. In fact, we've been cut and cut some more, down to about $5,280. Um, and the last little uh, line there uh, is if the November tax initiative fails, the governor does have another mid-year reduction plan for us, trigger cuts, as it were, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So how does California do compared to the rest of the nation? Not well. Um, currently, in 2010-11 last year, projected to be about $2,856 below the national average. If this chart went back to the mid-1940s, 1947, California was second in the nation uh, in funding per pupil. Today, uh, we're, we're racing to the bottom. Uh, almost last. So you can see there that in the 70s, uh, we were bumping right along the national average, sometimes a little above, sometimes below by $100, $200. And then starting in about 1980, we've seen this long decline into the mid-90s, somewhat recovery up to within $700 of the statewide average, of the national average, and now almost $3,000 behind the nation. It's a uh, pretty grim in California what uh, Sacramento has done to public education, in my humble opinion. So uh, the governor is uh, basing his current budget, which uh, has some significant cuts for us, on um, a $6.9 billion tax increase in November, uh, tax extensions and increases. Uh, He's funding us for next year based on a manipulation of Prop 98. Um, and if the, the current budget assumes the tax initiatives will be passed, if they don't pass, then he'll cut us by another $370 per ADA. Uh, basically, we've talked about this a little bit before. If the tax uh, measure in November based on the governor's proposal do not pass in November. Education takes 90% of the cuts of that. So make no mistake, it's not additional revenues for education. It's simply, if it doesn't pass, we'll cut you 90% uh, of what we don't get. Uh, what it means is the governor is uh, taking out his little scissors, cutting education by $500 million next year, 
Uh, and if the tax initiative fails, we lose almost $3 billion in education for next year. He takes out those big scissors. Some of his proposals, not even uh, counting the, uh, the tax initiative, uh, one is transportation proposal. We've talked about this. Uh, the trigger for this year, he's uh, cutting transportation funding by 50%, costing us about $1.6 million. Um, He's, uh, so he's, he's eliminating funding basically starting uh, this month going for the rest of the year, so a 50% reduction. For next year, he's uh, proposing to eliminate transportation altogether for us about a $3.2 million loss. We're aware that we're required to do home to school transportation for special education students based on their individual education plan, uh, not for regular education, and we'll be talking about transportation at a later date. There is a proposal in here to redo mandates. He's basically uh, recommending anybody who has followed the Commission on State Mandates, as I have over the last 25 years, uh, knows that uh, school districts have worked really hard to make sure the state lives up to its obligations when it passes laws and man pushes on additional mandates to public entities, to schools. Uh, the governor, this governor and previous governors have shirked the response, I mean have cut, I mean have, have not met that responsibility, <laughs> have whatever adjective or verb or adverb you want to use. Um, they haven't met it, but now the governor is taking a new twist on it. Hey, we'll just make it a block grant. You don't have to do any mandate you don't want to. If you do do these particular ones, will give you a, a block grant, a per pupil uh, amount. It's an interesting concept. We'll see how much traction he gets on it. Uh, meanwhile, we still budget zero for mandates because um, until we receive the money, we don't know that we're going to get it. Uh, big, big topic in this weighted student funding formula for next year. Uh, there's not a lot of detail, but what we do know is that he's asking to put together a bunch of categorical programs, not child nutrition, QEIA, ACES, and other federally funded programs, but other state uh, program dollars, and sending it to schools based on their English language learner populations and free and reduced lunches. He's going to have an accountability uh, measure built in uh, qualitative and test-based measures, and he's planning on phasing it in over five years. Uh, Department of Finance is saying 80% uh, of the district funding next year will be on a current law formula, 20% for weighted student formula for next year, and then phasing that in 20% each year over the next four years. He's not proposing to hold districts harmless, which means uh, next year some districts would win and some districts would lose. Uh, legislature has to enact these measures and we have no detail right now on how he plans on doing it. More to come. It will be an interesting spring. Child care. He plans on cutting uh, child care funding by about 33 percent, whacking it a third from about 1.5 billion dollars, reducing about 516 million. He plans on cutting out about 62,000 child care slots in California next year. I'm sorry Ms. Cooper isn't here to um, hear that, but she, she's got it in her folder and she knows. I know she'd have something to say about that, but he plans on raising income levels and changing the program and basically just cutting it by a third and uh, eliminating child care for 60,000 of the neediest kids in California. Uh, next topic, and, and we're still working on what that would all mean to our child care program, and uh, they will be working diligently on that because we're sure it will affect us significantly. Uh, next topic, transitional kindergarten, SB uh, 1381 uh, said that kids whose birthday who turn five in 2012 in the month of November or between November 2nd and December 2nd will be eligible to go into a transitional 
kindergarten, which is basically a two-year kindergarten class, the first year being a, a developmentally appropriate for the younger children, kindergarten type education, but more developmental. And then the following year, they'd go into regular kindergarten, and they were going to fund it with basic uh, ADA. Unfortunately, the governor is now saying we're not going, he does not want to fund that $223 million. So, and also saying districts do not have to provide that transitional kindergarten for those kids uh, that are turning five in November in 2012, and then October 2013 and September 2014, because the law has changed on kindergarten enrollment. California is one of the later states uh, for enrolling kindergartners as of, since their date is, turns five, December 2nd, they can be in kindergarten. Um, we're one of the latest states in the country. Uh, so most of the states are earlier. Uh, they've passed a law, changed the law to moving those dates one month ahead, starting next year for the next three years, going to November 1st and then October 1st and then September 1st in 2014. So if your child was born October, November, December, uh, they will not be eligible for uh, enrolling in kindergarten, and the transitional kindergarten was the state's answer to you know, providing services for those younger kindergartners. However, uh, no funding for transitional kindergarten, but the law still goes into effect. The net effect of this is we believe we'll lose about 150 kindergartners next year that we would otherwise have. So our kindergarten enrollment next year would decline by 150. If you did it on, on a timeline, then the next year they're moving the date back from November 1 to October 1. We lose another 150, however those first 150 come back because now they're ready to be in kindergarten. So really the net effect of this is we lose 100, about 150 kids over the next three years each year, but just 150. And then after that, we go into a steady state on, on kindergartners. So it's sort of an interesting dynamic. However, we will need less, we will be funded for less kids and therefore have less, right. Interesting. Uh, second to last slide here is sort of the, the timeline, and when you, when you put it in this way, it really does seem ridiculous the way Sacramento and the way the governor is uh, proposing his budget. We know by law the governor must, by January 10th, proposes, uh, make his proposals. March 15th is a preliminary notice uh, layoffs for certificated staff required. There's an April 29th for, fed, for specially funded programs or 45 days for classified service layoffs. Uh, the May revision this year is due on May 14th. Uh, May 15th is a final certificated layoff notice uh, served, but those have to be hand delivered, and so we won't even have the May 14th, uh, May revise until we have to give the final notices. However, remember, even final notices can be rescinded any time uh, up until school starts, actually any time. Um, it's just we have to make the notice just in case. Uh, June 28th, there's a lot of initiatives uh, vying to be on the ballot in November at this time. Last count, I think there were six different initiatives for taxes, for funding, for public education. Uh, June 30th, we know by then the state will adopt their budget. We have to adopt our budget. Then there's August, September, October, and there in November 6th, there's a general election whether we're going to have mid-year cuts or not. Um, you can see just on the timeline, it, it really is absurd. Um, so we know the timeline. So with that, what does it all mean to PUSD? What has the governor done to us this year? Um, Right now, we know we have to make about $3.2 million in cuts next year, just what we'd call uh, our last projections in, um, as of December 13th. We added that the mid-year reduction of $1.6 million in transportation, $235,000 in revenue limit for mid-year reductions, $3 million for the COLA being zeroed out next year, and about $3.2 million in transportation reductions, totaling about $11.2 million. So we've been talking about that now for a little bit. There it is, pretty straightforward. Um, five bullets. Uh, now, 
there is uh, a uh, Senate bill out there right now, Senate Bill 81, uh, that is attempting to make, instead of eliminating transportation, uh, to make those dollar cuts on a per ADA basis. If that were to go through for current year and for next year, instead of uh, losing 1.6 and then the 3.2 million, we lose um, about $34 per ADA instead of, um, instead of $88 is what it comes out to for us. So uh, we end up with about $8.3 million in reductions needed instead of 11.2. Uh, so that gives you the magnitude of the difference of a per ADA basis statewide or what transportation means to us. And as bad as it is to us, it's even more significant in rural districts throughout California where they uh, educate kids uh, in long distances and where transportation funding is uh, really can be up to 25% of their entire budget. Uh, now, uh, the last one, I, I never like to use the term worst case scenario because I don't trust the governor, the state, or pretty much anybody in Sacramento and how they've treated public education. However, if uh, we take our $11.2 million in reductions that we need uh, based on the, the transportation being uh, eliminated and we add to that the November election failing and the governor actually reducing us by $370 per ADA. Now remember last year trigger language was up to $300 and he did $13. So there's a big difference in what they said and then what actually happened, which was a good thing. So now they're saying up to $370. Uh, that would be an additional $6.7 million for us or a total of about needing $18 million in reduction for next year. Uh, if you were to ask me my recommendation today, I'd say we go with option one, look at about $8.3 million in reductions for next year. Uh, if the worst case scenario happens and they actually cut another $370 per ADA, which I cannot imagine, I really can't. However, if they did, uh, Mr. Selinski, you have said a number of times over the years, when is it that we would use our reserve for economic uncertainties? And I will tell you, this, this would be the time, November of 2012, so we'd adopt the budget based on sort of the, the top scenario, and whatever they cut us mid-year, that's why we have our reserve for economic uncertainties, because we're uncertain. So that's my, that would be my recommendation. I'm open for questions. Mr. Solinsky. Mr. Chair, I'm not sure where the um, Finance Committee has gotten in their discussions of uh, potential reductions or staff and their thinking. Um, I guess the question in my mind is, how do we continue to provide a quality education considering the economic impacts? and? Uh, I don't know if it was superintendent or where, where if it came out of the five-star coalition from other superintendents, but are we better off reducing the school number of days in school to affect our budget versus cutting any more in terms of staffing and programs? And, and I also am concerned about how we maintain our schools at a quality level in terms of our support staff and how what kind of standard are we going to do to protect, um, well, protect the investment we're making in our Measure TT funds? And so if you look at, t let's say, $8 million in cuts, if we just, if we were to look at, and this is a big, broad number, if it's a million dollars a day that it costs us to operate, whatever our cuts Whatever, however many millions we have to cut, that's the number of school days that we would need to cut. As just a simple formula, and that is how we, in the short run, look at balancing our budget. So I don't know, again, I don't, I'm not privy to the Finance Committee and what their discussions are. I'm sure there's some opportunities for more effectiveness <laughs> or efficiencies, but I think after how many years of reviewing and reviewing, what was, We've been on an eight-year cut trend. Is that, uh, that's my historical recollection, vague. I think we need to think differently on how we approach this problem and how we serve our community. And I also still would ask us 
do we need to also ask our local community to consider uh, under the circumstances uh, another parcel tax to increase revenue for in support of our uh, students? Um, we haven't um, received um, ideas for the reductions yet at the Finance Committee from the ELT or DPT or other, yeah. group, other groups or yeah. staff. Um, who have been thinking about this dire situation. So we will soon, but so I can't answer that question. Um, I do think that the uh, some of the things I've heard, let's start with the bottom, is that the only reasonable approach to that failing would be to shorten the school year at that point. Uh, now, what I'm unclear on is whether that has to be agreed to in terms of a negotiation and furloughs or whatever you call them. I think it does. I think it has to be agreed to. Yeah, it has to be negotiated. Yeah, it's my understanding. So well, I, I think isn't there language in collective bargaining that economic necessity, I think is the terminology, that we could determine what happens based on economic necessity. Well, if Yoli doesn't have, I don't mean to say this the wrong way, if, if she doesn't have to negotiate, I'm sure she'll, no. But I mean, if <laughs> you have the power, right, to um, do something unilaterally, I'm sure the board would consider that. I'm just not sure that that's the case. I, I would want to be very clear. This is against philosophically where I think we need to go. I think several months ago, I stated to the board that we should make it our goal to increase the number of day, school year, days in the school year over 10 years by one day a year over let the me, next 10 years. Let me change. Years. I so. just texted the newspaper that you were you wanted to shorten the year. You want me to change that? <laughs> okay. So um, the, uh, I, th I think we all want to increase the instructional time, right? But um, the, uh, but I think that that's the only reasonable, I've, uh, that's the only reasonable scenario for um, that at that late juncture, I think Ms. Dr. Papalardo said some interesting adjective at that point, right? How late that was in November to do that, right? So, yeah, you would, what are you going to do? I mean. The, the gov right, and the governor <coughs> did, the governor did make some statement about it being equivalent to 15 school days, the, the cut if the, the taxes don't pass, and uh, there'll have to be further legislation on that. Currently, we still have the option of going to a 175-day school year. Right now, we're at 178. Um, and so we're two below the 180. Plus, there's three additional days this year that people took as furlough days, non-school days. So this year, there are the five days. And, and next year, the furlough days are not negotiated at this time. So they're actually coming back in. Uh, so. Uh, Potentially, the maximum number of furlough days currently under law we'd be uh, able to have would be eight with uh, our certificated uh, bargaining unit. And any bargaining discussion is an appropriate closed session item. I asked a few questions of staff earlier, and uh, one was. Um, about transportation, one was on child care, and one was on the transitional kinder issue. And what they kind of have in common is that there are areas in which parents need to know because it changes what they might be doing for next year, where their kids might be attending school. So my understanding is we're going to hear some information about transportation tomorrow at our finance subcommittee meeting. Um, as you said, I think child care is still kind of working on what impact that will have. But again, if the, these are big changes for parents. And then transitional kindergarten, the answer I got was that we were going to hand out enrollment packets saying that transitional kinder is dependent on what the state decides. And so my question is, who are we giving the, to whom are we giving those packets? Everyone who's in that month, 
And are we offering it at children's home school? Or are we telling people, here's your enrollment packet. If you do get to come to school, it's going to be at XYZ school. So I'm just trying to figure out is, you know, what are we doing now? Because I think we would be encouraging parents, either through open enrollment or other ways, to be starting to think about signing up their kids for next year. So I'm just trying to figure out. I know we don't know, but we're going to have either plan A or plan B. And we just want to tell parents it's one of these two, and I wasn't sure how specific we're going to be. And then I guess for board policy, I don't know whether it makes sense to try and pass a board policy on transitional kindergarten when it is up in the air. But I don't want to be caught on a you know suddenly in June. Oops, now we need one, and we are we are definitely working on all those issues, <laughs> and I and I don't have the answer to all of those questions at this time. But we are working on them. We are. And so the person who could answer more specifically about the enrollment packets and what information we're giving to parents would be? Yeah, Dr. Onoye. For transitional kindergarten, Great, thank you. Okay. Mr. Miramontes? How many uh, board meetings do we have before we have to approve the list of March 15th, the March 15th roster? Well, there's probably three if you consider February 14th, the 28th, and then the first meeting in March. And three. Will we most likely have a study session before a budget study session, right? We talked about it. Um, because, I mean, just hearing Tom and, you know, I think we've been talking about alternative scenarios, because usually what happens cyclically is that we have, you know, two board meetings and then a special session, and we we have to we have to authorize this roster and this deep cut, and again, just reminding that all of us that uh, it there is a major trauma kind of you know that goes throughout our people who've been working with us, families who've been working with us for several years, and if we can minimize that, we should be talking about it. Um, sooner rather than later, Ms. Zulinski, to your point, uh, without getting in the realm of collecting bargaining, but if there's a way that there is a reduction operating cost through reduction of academic, uh, academic days, I would lean towards that because sometimes it's about quality and not quantity, and we just have to do more with less in that regard. I do favor, you know, I, there's areas of the collective bargaining agreement that I, you know, cannot live with, historically can't live with, which is, you know, first one in, first one out. And uh, we've seen a slide back of, of gains, academic gains through that. Last one in. Last one, one, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Last, thank you. One. Last one in, first one out. LIFO. 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 <laughs> right. <laughs> right, so, so there's a, there's kind of a... Not FIFO, right? So there's a, a disequity, disequity there, and I think everybody wants to keep their teachers in every school site. Everybody wants to keep, you know, the hardworking uh, janitors and landscapers, our hardworking clerical folks, and our assistants. Everybody, I think, that is unanimous. How we, it's unrealistic if we could get there, and this is where we diverge. And usually, it's probably the easiest way. We we you know we sign off on what is the easiest way, with which is to create a roster, personnel roster of March 15th that is much larger with saying, hey, we're going to hire them back, but we've seen through the librarians and other positions, we lose some of them. So if we could get some feedback some, some from the staff regarding that uh, item that uh, Mr. Salinsky's uh, question, if we get some more information on that. Um, and are these numbers uh, reflective of the reality that there's no more mandated uh, furloughs because there is a, it's an artificial okay so it's built in right I mean that, that there's no the assumption furlough there are no furlough now. days is built into this correct and added back yeah they've been added back in okay they've been added back okay yes it's a number of big okay just 
just hopefully in the so finance if had, committee. So if the, if the bargain unit agreed to furlough days, it would reduce that, okay. uh, that deficit. But, but am I correct in assuming that for the purposes of March 15th preliminary layoff notices, if we don't have some kind of agreement, we have to make the assumption that it's possible we might not have that agreement and therefore we have to notice mm -hmm. to that extent, which is the sort of unfortunate bind we're in because of the timing. And so... Um, so the number is, just so we get this on the record, a ballpark figure of actual, the actual men and women Right, that are potentially on the on the chopping block, you know, CSEA, Teamsters, UTP, ballpark figure, administrators. Good. Hey, he he threw it in there. He threw it in there. <laughs> yeah, he threw it in there. Yeah, look at that. Um, sorry to make it lighter, but yeah, you think I forgot about it, right? Um, what well, is it? Eighty? Well, seventy? I, I can tell you at eleven million dollars a. a, a Rough number mm -hmm. would be 150. Uh, if, if that people. were the only place we would have more reduction. But we yeah. start at 150, right? And even with 50%, finding other cuts, other things we could work with, we're looking at 75. 75 real folks currently, right now, working for us. Okay. Just want to remind us in terms of the impact. That, that would be less any attrition. Retirements, retirements. So it's a good time to retire if you can in education right now. So timeline. I mean, it's a win-win. <laughs> <laughs> to answer um, your question on timeline, we have a regular meeting on the 14th and the 28th. We're meeting with the city on the 21st, which is the Tuesday in between, and then we were hoping to do March 15th on March 6th because of a need to to get them to everyone in a timely fashion. So that's every Tuesday except for next Tuesday. And the, the budget committee will likely be working weekly, at, yeah. you know, yeah. given what we're dealing with, so. John wants to see us every week. Um, I, Aren't you glad you're here? Ms. Pomeroy. <laughs> yes, to, oh, John, thinking, thinking about attrition, is there, is there the latitude to offer some incentives? Well, we, we have offered, we did offer the incentive two years in a row, so three months of salary two years ago, or two years ago, and two months last year. So, you know, the incentive, if you offer it every year, it just becomes a, a, a bonus and not an incentive. So in order for an incentive to work, you can't do it every year. So we have done it the last two years pretty successfully. I think now it's uh, time to uh, let people decide that they need to do it the otherwise. Otherwise, if you did it this year again, my expectation is you'd get a lot less people because they're going, well, I could go one more year and they'll offer it next year too because things aren't going to get better. Okay, the one thing that we can do and we should all be doing is to actively advocate for SB 81. And if that passes, that that's, a, that's $3 million for us roughly. Um, so... It's, it's to shift from the current allocation, which is based on the past funding levels, to allocate it evenly across all districts and to, you know, there's been articles in the, in the Times about the particular impacts on rural districts, but it also hits urban districts significantly. Um, and we can get some more information out there, but I know that we're probably, we have a higher ADA loss of funding than LA Unified and certainly far greater than any surrounding district. So the more we can equalize that, the better. That's, it's fair, it's, we need to share the pain. So we'll be advocating with uh, our local uh, press and our uh, legislators. So unless there's anything else, I think we can move on and we have some uh, challenging work ahead. Thank you, Mr. P.